three buffers. So if you look at the heat profile for them, there's not much of a difference between the switching and non-switching power and thermal profile, you know, maybe a watt. Are there any ways that you can see to, in the future, to bring down the power draw and the heat consumption so that you can get, you know, denser arrays of memory and maybe not a heat sink, maybe not a big fan over the memory? Which Oh, the system memory? Yeah, the fully buffered data. Right. Is, oh. Do you see any tricks that you could apply to bring down the power and the heat? Um, do we really have a, a memory um, expert here? I guess it's I, one of your I, ingredients. Well, this is storing uh, bits. That's you. Well, you know, <laughs> you're right. Storing bits is me. Uh, but I'm in the non-volatile storing bits. So I'm not a, I'm not a DRAM guy, unfortunately. So, uh, so tell us how you're going to replace fully buffered DIMMs with Flash. <laughs> <laughs> Make it up. Yeah. Um, Actually, yeah, so. I'll tell you as much as I know. Uh, so the first generation of fully buffered DIMMs that you've seen, yes, they've come out slightly higher end. Uh, and the issue, if I hope you understand the issue, the real issue is really the physics that we're dealing with, right? CV square F, um, you know, you have certain swing voltage because you have certain topology um, and you have frequency that really governs the power. So there's no magic there. Um, it is just the trace lengths that we need to drive. Now, we are looking at, uh, you know, signaling as we go forward to see if we can reduce the power. We're also looking at architecturally, if you could uh, power down certain, you know, dims if they're not being used. So there are things that we could do, but um, will that make a tremendous difference? Um, you know, that's to be, you know, that's to be seen once we start doing the work. Um, but uh, I want to assure you that we are really looking at reducing the power because that's a huge source of headache. So I'd like to kind of make sure we mix things up a little bit, give, give everybody, uh, make everybody feel the love. Do I have any, uh, any digital home or vibe related questions? <laughs> Anybody have a vibe? <laughs> All right. Yeah, um, one, of the, one of the things that was brought up was that if you build your own PC, you can't do vibe. Is that something going to change? Uh, it seems like it'd be, it'd be a good, um, not marketing, or I could say marketing, but I guess marketing is a bad thing to say here. Uh, point that would get more um, traction in the home when a lot of people build their own machines or operate them. Um, yeah, that's a, a good question. Uh, you know, one of the uh, challenges there is that uh, uh, Intel Vive technology is uh, based on uh, Windows Media Center Edition, uh, and that's not a retail product from Microsoft uh, at this point. And so, uh, you know, making sort of a standalone Vive offering a uh, a, basically a, a retail product as well uh, is kind of diff difficult at this point given the dependencies on the OS. Yeah, new <laughs> Well, you know, that's, that's one of the, uh, I guess, better uh, channels out there. Um, it, you know, I, again, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the offerings to date have been based on MCE and so, uh, you know, it basically goes through the, uh, the same OEM channels that, uh, the, that MCE goes through. Uh, yeah, you, I guess you can buy pieces here and there and yawn, uh, but uh, again, you know, part of the, um, the goal of Vive is to deliver a, a great user experience and not have to have users, you know, sort of futzing around assembling systems. Granted, there are some users out there that like to do that, uh, but uh, that's, uh, I guess, in some ways a, a difficult segment to cater to without uh, basically releasing things where uh, more mainstream users might get themselves uh, in over their heads and uh, not have the sort of experience that we're looking to deliver. Also, Intel's taken a lot of initiatives in form factors, except in a really small form factor. Uh, everything's proprietary, and that was brought up as being a really good point, but it doesn't bring the price point down. Everyone wants smaller, but no one wants to spend more. Is Intel doing anything to try to make that, you know, we have P Pico BTX, but you know, there's a lot of other proprietary things you have to do, which raises the cost. You're not gonna get a 499 small form factor. Yeah, so um, 
you know, I, I can address this from sort of, I guess, a broader perspective. And you know, one of the things that we are trying to do is to stimulate innovation in that space. And you've probably heard about uh, the sort of the million dollar challenge uh, in terms of trying to do, um, you know, quieter, cooler, more stylish, uh, 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 you know, home PCs going forward. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're trying to uh, stimulate some innovation there. In terms of the specific uh, new, you know, form factors for motherboards and the like, perhaps someone else here on the panel can speak to that. Uh, but uh, I'm not uh, aware of any specific initiatives to try to drive uh, down the two you know, significantly smaller uh, motherboards. But maybe someone else here on the panel uh, does have that information. No? I'm not aware. Maybe I'll go ferry a mic here a little. All right, let me get deep into the crowd here. I'm allowed to have a crowd. Uh, <laughs> you guys behind you might not be able to hear you well. Um, uh, concerning the vibe stuff, you said it, it's dependent on MCE. I was wondering, it's a two-part question, I guess. Um, uh, what components in MCE is it related to, is it dependent on? And the other thing is, uh, in terms of your future roadmap, are, are you intending to work with Apple and, and replace that dependency with more of a Unix-based? Okay, uh, both, both good questions. Uh, so on the first one, uh, you know, the, the idea behind Vive is to deliver a really terrific media experience. And you know, Microsoft has done a lot of work with Media Center Edition to provide uh, you know, basic infrastructure uh, around uh, media processing on the PC. You know, things like uh, you know, DVR capability and you know, bringing uh, program guides and the like uh, onto the platform. And so there's a lot of good infrastructure there uh, that's uh, only present with uh, Media Center Edition as opposed to some of the other uh, some of their other OS offerings, uh, and so we've uh, you know chosen to take advantage of those things as opposed to reinventing the wheel. I mean, you know, we we don't need to offer you know there don't need to be five different program guides uh, on, on on the PC, and so uh, you know Media Center Edition does provide some very good infrastructure to base those media experiences on. Um, with regard to moving to other operating systems, uh, there's no conceptual reason why you couldn't do that. Um, you know, however, you know the vast majority of consumers today. Um, you know, use uh, a, a Windows PC, uh, and so moving to Linux, while sort of an interesting thought exercise, probably isn't uh, a particularly compelling uh, PC experience for the vast majority of, of consumers. Um, you know, in terms of you know, sort of the Apple question <coughs> specifically, uh, you know, they, they've got a great uh, entertainment experience. It's you know, uses uh, Intel processors at this point. Um, you know, in some ways, I think we're very early in understanding. Um, you know. How exactly a PC fits into the overall, uh, you know, home environment outside of the den, uh, and at this point, I'm actually, you know, interested in having multiple uh, experiments out there to to see basically what works and what consumers like, and you know, having Windows-based experiences and uh, and, and Mac-based experiences out there, I think is a, is a good thing at this point. Thanks. Let me. Uh, I'll get back to you. <clears throat> Let me start on the I got a question. Hi, um, uh, Jimmy, you actually, we had a one-on-one -on -one briefing yesterday in relation to multiple, but I was wondering whether you or one of your colleagues could actually ask another quick question, answer another quick question about a multi-core, and that is about uh, if, the, if, if we move to these terascale architectures, are there any diminishing returns in terms of the power, the, let's say, let's say, let's say the, uh, sorry, the processing output you would get per core, and, and how would the scalability of algorithms differs, and it's unusual to get anything close to linear scaling out of a particular uh, algorithm uh, processing data. We expect that, well, our research is on both the algorithms and the hardware assists that keep that from flattening out the curve of return for putting it on more cores, obviously. And some examples we've discovered is there are certain algorithms that are not as good at low core counts that uh, seem to be much <coughs> inferior performance compared to something else at two, three, four cores that, however, continue to scale much better as you get up into 64, 128 cores. So we're exploring that. The other thing that can be applied if you get up into high core counts is recognition that it isn't necessarily the case that you <coughs> take every application and spread it across all the cores. Uh, if you have enough data, and for some applications they might be true, but certainly in HPC, for example, that, that may be very viable. But it's going to be a mixture of multitasking and multi-threading. And so we're going to expect to get a lot of benefit from 
having a lot of cores, by having uh, many applications running at the same time. In the server space, for example, using virtualization technology to create multiple machines within a machine that are therefore easier to manage and reduce the cost of ownership, but still give you the kind of allocation of resources, dedication of compute resources that you'd like to see. So we expect that go, as we go to higher and higher core counts, we'll both have to do our homework on uh, allowing the software designers to effectively identify and express the parallelism in their problem. But we also plan that people will be running many things simultaneously. We'll get a lot of value out of multitasking. Uh, in terms of algorithms, the complexity of, of organizing explicitly a whole bunch of threads is going to be something that will tend to limit the return as you get up to very high core counts. And so we're looking at techniques like not just simplifying the expression of parallelism and language work and libraries, it's going on in uh, Jeff's uh, realm as well, but also operations and libraries that uh, express data parallel operations. It's simpler for a programmer not to orchestrate a bunch of threads, but rather to say, do these things to this entire block of data, where you have very data parallel uh, tasks, then operations, functional operations expressed in the language of the library mean the programmer isn't thinking in terms of 128 cores or 64 cores or 8 cores. They're thinking in terms of their data and having certain operations or sequence of operations done to them. So we're looking at all those things to help scale better, uh, even though we don't expect linear scaling, we expect to continue to get return on applying more cores to problems. Jeff, Jeff what are you doing on the compiler plans, well, I first wanted to answer, make another point, which is it's, it's not necessarily true that all the cores in the future will be the same. On a, on a we might have some that are very powerful and others that are smaller. And that mixture is something that we're still working out. And we also will very likely have special purpose cores that accelerate particular types of activities, you know, like XML processing or even perhaps certain types of scientific algorithms or uh, cryptography, things like that. So that there'll be a bigger mix. It won't just be homogeneous. And uh, on the programming front or the programming tools front, we are doing a lot of work to, to make sure that it, it's, it's actually easy, or as easy as it can be, to spread an algorithm across a number of cores. And Intel has, um, the people who have the most experience with this are the <coughs> computer company, companies. And, and Intel has bought or made alliances with the uh, major supercomputer software vendors. We, Crook and Associates joined us uh, five or six years ago. Palis, which made uh, debuggers for supercomputers. Is, uh, is now part of Intel. So we have the best set of tools for, uh, for building parallel programs, and we're bringing that experience from HPC down to uh, the personal computer space, and, and have, uh, we'll be able to use these same tools for doing media algorithms and the other type of applications that we see in the future. I, I, want, I wanted to add one minor point. Um, there also are some interesting structural aspects of these multi-core systems that will lead to performance improvements in the applications. In particular, memory uh, that is shared, the communication between processors is now much better than it was in sort of a, tr a traditional um, symmetric multiprocessor system. And so the applications, the algorithms can actually take advantage of the fact that now they don't have to split their data, they can take advantage of shared data um, that will be accessible um, much more rapidly. Uh, the simple shared memory processing model that we use today also may not be the uh, best fit for all the market segments or all the programmers. So we're looking into how the hardware can support multiple programming models where you have, for example, distributed memory or some degree of distributed memory, which is a proven technique in the parallel programming community up to now. So we're looking at the flexibility uh, to support multiple programming models and other things that exploit what people have learned working in parallel programming. All right, you've been pretty patient waiting here. So thanks for waiting. Yeah, one quick comment and then my question. The, the comment about Vive, you got commercially available Vive components now. The full set's available right now, from processors to motherboards, including Intel motherboards, and many other manufacturers are building Vive motherboards. 
you got Vive compliant TV tuners, you know, other devices, plus certainly D, uh, Vive compliant display devices, plus, you know, media extenders, etc. All this stuff's available now, other than you can't logo it yourself, but if you're only one person, who cares? The question is related to, you know, we're now to 64 bit, and only with this generation have you, the core logic jumped up to supporting eight, eight uh, gigabit of memory, a gigabyte of memory. So you see some movement in that direction because almost none of the systems in the marketplace are going to offer more than four gig, and, and seldom you see above two gig. So yeah, I'm assuming that uh, your uh, your question is regarding mainstream market. Yes, sir. Okay. And higher end of that. Uh, or the higher end. Um, actually, if you um, I don't know if you've seen some of the workstation products, sure. uh, you know that um, you. can support them based on our server line of chipsets. Yeah. That support that, and uh, you know, in, over the years, what has happened is the boundary between <coughs> high-end PC and a workstation is blurred. I actually, a lot of companies are building you know high-end PCs and workstations out of the same thing. So the best answer for you would be to look for those configurations if you wanted more memory. Um, more memory is not the issue because you you've already gone over to FPDIM, so that's not an issue. That's not mainstream. That's not the side that people are going out and buying. I'm talking about the capability in Intel's own boards now to go to 8 gig, okay? And having some expectation that people will actually go there. I, I, I hear you. Um, the, the, the decision on how much <coughs> we put on the motherboard or how much we support on the chipset is directly based on customer feedback. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna buy, um, you know, Quantity of hundred, the answer is no, it won't be available. If you're going to buy quantity of million, this can be done. <laughs> so uh, I don't think this is a technical problem. Uh, well, what I'm saying uh, is, it is really a business uh, issue. Well, you guys work with IHVs, and IHVs are telling you where they need to go, and mm -hmm. are they telling you they need to go to eight? I, I'd be happy to take a card and you know, uh, send it to the vice president of uh, the division that makes the motherboard. Remember, the idea is uh, hire the you know, higher end of the motherboard so you can make more money. So obviously we are motivated, you know, who wants to sell motherboards for $399 PC? There's not much money left. Um, so we would love to do this if there's a market, but these decisions, you know, and I'm not a business guy, uh, but these decisions are primarily based on dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to it. Technically, as, as you know, it can be built. Right? It, there's a simple answer. All right, so I'm starting to feel a little left out here. Do we have like a Robson question? <laughs> <laughs> I want to like in on this deal here. You know, got a Robson <laughs> question here? Raise your hand if you have a Robson question. <laughs> Now, I shorted you last time. I didn't get a chance to really answer your question. So I'll, 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 different questions. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll still catch up with you. But let me uh, get from here. Oh, the simple, the singular question. So the current generation, the PCI Express goes to 2.5 gig, and the SRI goes to 3 gig, and uh, FBD uses the 4 gig range. So the, it is a below 5 gig. So at the next generation, PCI Express, goes to five, and the SAT goes to six, and the FBD2 goes to eight gigabit. So the, what is next? So the, and then, uh, how much frequency is upper limit via kappa connection? The next generation taking PCI Express is possible for the 12 gigabit, if maybe SAT is possible for the FBD3 or four, I don't know, but is it possible with uh, kappa connection? Okay, so uh, there's a couple different questions here about uh, how fast can we go uh, with our high-speed serial uh, signaling yeah. over copper. Uh, so uh, I can tell you from a serial ATA perspective, and then uh, Ajay could probably tell you about the PCI Express, what the scalability is there. Uh, so on serial ATA, uh, we are uh, in the process of creating the third generation of serial ATA signaling, which uh, doubles the speed once again uh, from 3 gigabits per second to 6 gigabits per second. 
At six gigabits per second, uh, we don't see any uh, problem doing that uh, with the sufficient signaling quality over copper. And so for our next generation, uh, no problem. Uh, going from six to 12, uh, for serial ATA. We don't know how to do that yet and still meet this, the kind of mainstream cost target and backward compatibility that the drive industry uh, uh, requires. And so it's, it's, a, it's a big unknown right now uh, for uh, 12 gigabit serial ATA. Um, we're not going there yet. Uh, and so uh, and one thing that we've kind of discovered when, uh, for the, uh, the roadmap for serial ATA is that uh, you don't necessarily have to solve all of the problems uh, at the beginning because uh, the technology evolves with you. So by the time our third generation is mature and, uh, and shipping in volume, it's possible that some new techniques have been developed that would allow us then to go to the next step. But right now, uh, we don't have for serial ATA a clear vision for how we get to 12. Um, but the, um, uh, and, and it may not be viable with the same kind of El Cheapo connectors and cables that we have for serial ATI. I mean, you're all familiar with how, uh, how those cables and connectors are. Uh, they're really not, uh, uh, you know, tremendously sophisticated cables and connectors, but on the upside, they're quite cheap. Uh, and so uh, cheap makes up for a lot of, uh, a lot of bills. Uh, so Ajay, why don't you give us a little bit of uh, PCI Express capability? So this is a question that we, uh, now that we're done with the Gen 2 uh, definition, this is what we're thinking about, whether the next step is seven and a half, or is it 10, okay? Um, theoretically, in the lab, um, I've seen signaling run on copper for up to 15 giga transfers, okay, 50. So, you know, and, you know, um, 10 gig E people have figured out a way to go on copper, even, you know, short haul for at 10. So there are techniques available. The key question, as Knut pointed out, um, is the connectors, the motherboards, you know, how much cost, and, and the clock, sources, because you have to ma manage very tight jitter. Um, how much money will you spend? So that's one consideration. The second consideration um, is that of how much filtering will you do? Because now you get into receiver equalization and you'll have to spend significant amount of your die and thereby power to extract the signal. So those are the questions that we are thinking about now. And the third thing is, if you do this, how much compatibility to take forward? Can you run the MPC Express at Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3, and Gen 4 speeds? Um, and how do you do this? So these are all the things that we've just started looking at. Um, so internally, just theoretically, you know, we have a small group of people that are starting to, you know, understand uh, answers to some of these things. But it is a little too early, and I think we'll get to seven and a half to 10 range. The next piece of Express will be around there. All right. Um, let me rotate a little bit. I'll give you a second, another chance. Sure. I just want to give everybody a chance to, to have a shot at it, all right? Works for me. And, and oh. Why don't you go ahead, since uh, I know I kind of shorted you last time, and uh, go ahead. But I think you gave, gave me enough last time that I have a, a notion of my answer. I have a different question than Chris Delrobson. Um, from my understanding, talk to people at the show and before the show, is that there are probably some intellectual property issues involved with Microsoft and using in hybrid disks, and that Linux may not be able to take advantage of the same stuff that Microsoft's doing there. Um, Robson, does Robson have because of its architectural differences, uh, any encumbrances that a Linux could do it, first of all, and then is there any roadmap that shows in, in, uh, in the Intel world of actually trying to support a, a Linux system using Robson? Yeah, so the, uh, uh, the Robson technology, there's, uh, there's no inherent barriers with the Robson technology for supporting a range of operating systems. And uh, you would have already shown Robson um, um, demonstrations running on both XP and Vista, which are substantially uh, different operating systems in terms of uh, their, their behaviors. Uh, and so there's um, no, no technical barrier and there's no uh, IP kind of a barrier 
uh, that would uh, preclude uh, Robson from applying to uh, uh, whatever OS um, that uh, we want to deliver the driver support for. Really, the uh, the question for Robson ends up being, um, uh, you know, how many OSs do we want to develop the uh, the necessary driver infrastructure for to support the Robson card? And right now, we're just looking to our customers and uh, committing to them that uh, we'll you know we'll give them what they what they ask us to deliver. Uh, in terms of support for different operating environments on Robson. All right, let me go. Let me go deep here a little bit, and uh, make sure the guys at the end of the room don't feel uh, left out. Uh oh, the PR guy in the room. You have the best behavior, guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how does any of this new technology relate to emerging telecom platforms such as advanced PCA, uh, micro PCA, IP? Can you elaborate a little more on which technology you're referring to? Uh, sort of any of them. I don't think there's, there hasn't been much telecom talk here at all. Uh, unfortunately, our network guy, probably our telecom guy, is probably the Yavakar or somebody, right? Yavakar or Yavakar. Let me tell there's a little part of uh, ATCA that I know because we worked on that. Uh, so PCI Express is on ATCA backplane, as you know. Um, and um, so those pins are there. I think the infrastructure is there. There's also uh, the notion of compact PCI or some me mezzanine card form factor. So the PCI, uh, PCI Express technology is adopted in ATCA. I forget the version number but uh, it is already on the back plane. And as we evolve PCI Express architecture, um, that technology is available to all the ATCA stuff. Um, in terms of CPUs, um, we have a lot of customers who actually use our CPUs and chipsets, and so the technologies that we have for you know, servers and put them in ATCA form factor. So uh, there is, a, you know, deep penetration of some things that we do in ATCA. Okay, we got the roving mic that's uh, taking care of the next one. Okay. Um, it's interesting hearing about all the, uh, the main core research and, and all that. I'm a software guy at a company that does a lot of you know, highly parallel computers and, you know, Parallel software is hard, and, and you, you have some interesting research projects to uh, try to address that. You know, but they're research projects, and there's been a lot of research projects in this direction for the past 20 years, and parallel programming is still hard. How are, how are you going to get the research into the hands of people that actually need to use it? Well, I think we work closely with the Software and Solutions Group, who has a very active multi-thing enabling program. And the work ranges from working with universities to reestablish this in the curriculum because we have to <coughs> begin to train programmers to think parallel in analysis of their uh, their data and their problem, but also to restart some of the research. Uh, moving it mainstream is hard. We can't wait till uh, <coughs> the solution. SSG has some threading building blocks. They have some multi-threading correctness checking to help with that problem. I think it's, uh, you're right, it's always going to re remain more difficult than the single, single threaded program. But if we can bring to the ecosystem some tools like transactional memory, uh, software transactional memory even scales very well because it removes the complexity of managing many locks or most locks and therefore makes the code easier to write without uh, sacrificing performance with very coarse grain locks. You can get the performance of a more sophisticated implementation without the challenge of working through the lock protocols, getting them co uh, correct, and opens the door to things like composition of objects. One of the things that's helped productivity in the software world is that people don't build from scratch anymore. And they actually deal at a very high level often, the mainstream programmers, with building blocks 
trying to get those parallelized, but also put in place the tools to make sure that they can be composed and used together without uh, blocking each other, without, uh, as they often do now, having incompatible protocols in, and locking, for example. I think those are things we don't have to wait till we get to 64, 128 cores. I don't think they're long-term research. I think there is some advanced development and the libraries and the abstractions along the way uh, are actually, I think, in beta or coming out in our SSG group. So I, I just want to make an analogy. Uh, parallel programming is never going to be easy, so you, you'll always be out of pay. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, our, our goal is to make sure that, that most people who are developing software will not have to be parallel programming experts. And, and I think a good analogy is with distributed computing. And if you went back 20 or 30 years, that was considered a really impossible problem. But today, the internet is everywhere, and most people writing applications for the internet know nothing about distributed computing and, <coughs> and uh, you know, atomic transactions, things like that. All of that is, is packaged up, and people just write you know, their, their little script or their little business logic, and the other stuff is done by middleware that's delivered. So we need to make that happen for parallel programming, and, and I think it's possible. You know, a, a different analogy is, Almost everyone has a highly parallel computer on their uh, processor on their PC today, which is their graphics card. And that's programmed through a very tight domain-specific interface, you know, DirectX or something similar like that. And again, the DirectX programmer is not really a parallel programmer. He's working in the graphics world. And then there's this dynamic compiler, which introduces the parallelism as it gets mapped to the graphics card. So I, I think there's ways to hide the, the real hard problems from the, from the average guy, and, and I, I think that's how, how things will evolve. So, um, just to let you guys know, I know that, uh, that Brenda needs to slip out a couple minutes early, and so um, uh, what I'd like to do is maybe take a, one more live question, knowing that, that you're not going to get a chance um, to ask another live question um, toward the end here, because uh, he's got to slip out a little bit early, unfortunately, because of some conflicting responsibilities he has. So, live question. All right, front line here. Hi. I really thought by this time we'd have home servers, but now everything's going into home entertainment. But do you foresee the day that, that Vive can also take care of my heating and my hot water and <laughs> burglar alarm and, and all the, and my refrigerator? I mean, when my refrigerator is running out of milk, I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think there's actually some. Uh... Uh, there's, uh, uh, you know, I think, uh, uh, several uh, Asian uh, companies that are actually offering uh, PCs integrated into refrigerators today, so I'm not uh, exactly sure what all that offers to you, but uh, I do know the products are available. So, um, you know, I, I think your question is probably more along the lines of home control and automation uh, more generally. Uh, and, you know, I think there's actually a fair amount, from a, a technical perspective, I think there's actually a fair amount of potential there. Um, you know, I look at uh, energy, you know, making efficient use of energy in your home uh, as, you know, being a real sort of dollars and cents way uh, that, uh, you know, homeowners could, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, adopt this technology and, uh, uh, and actually have it, uh, you know, in, in enhance uh, their at least financial well-being in terms of, you know, uh, turning off lights and more intelligently managing their uh, HVAC. Uh, you know, uh, to, to keep the climate uh, comfortable and the like. Uh, so I think there's some real potential there. Um, that said, you know, this is also an area where, uh, you know, I look back 10 or 15 years and, you know, you've had X10, uh, you know, home control technology for quite a number of years out there that are, you know, are, uh, uh, you know uh, bridges to uh, allow the PC to control uh, the X10 devices in the home. There's a number of, of much newer and more capable uh, home automation and control technologies uh, out there and, you know, available at this point. Uh, that you know really you know go beyond uh, you know sort of uh, what X10 had to offer. Uh, that said, you know for whatever reason, uh, this hasn't been something that has really resonated uh, in the mass market, and I can't necessarily explain sort of why uh, that hasn't. And I know, you know I'm personally interested, and I know sort of anecdotally, uh, you know many other technical people who are interested in the concept. Um, that says for whatever reason this hasn't been something where there's been sort of you know very clear cut. I think sort of mainstream value propositions associated with the technology. So the technology is there, I, you know, I, th I think you could do it. Uh, it's just a, uh, you know, it's a question at this point as to uh, you know, what it will take to actually spur sort of mass market adoption of it. Uh, and I frankly am not, I, I don't have the magic answer there. You what can you say about that on the show for? On your, in the e-hall, in your digital yeah. home? Yeah. 
So another part of this question, and it was, uh, what can you say about live servers or mm -hmm. home bulk data store? Sure. Um, so, you know, with, with regard to uh, entertainment content, uh, you know, uh, Vibe delivers a... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Is this a picture taking opportunity? Yeah, 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 sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Intel Vive technology, uh, uh, coupled with the Media Center Edition, you know, offers the ability to serve up uh, content uh, to other devices in the house, such as digital media uh, adapters or uh, you know, televisions or other devices uh, that actually include that functionality. Uh, in uh, Paul Adelini's uh, keynote, uh, he announced uh, that DirecTV was going to be integrating uh, digital media adapter capability into their set-top boxes, uh, and so that would you know, obviously be a client for content being served from an Intel Vive technology PC. So you know, I think that you know, as we see the home network become a more robust uh, you know, a solution, uh, and you know, and as uh, you know, consumers have an interest in having connected experiences between their devices and be able to, you know, consume entertainment content sort of anywhere, anytime they like in the home. Uh, I think we're going to see more and more uh, of the PC taking on a server-ish role uh, in, in the home, uh, and so you know, I, I think we're you know, sort of at the point now where those usage models can start to take off, and again. You know, the availability of robust home networking technology, I think, has been a real gating item, uh, you know, up until now. But uh, with, you know, the combination of, for those of us lucky enough to have uh, Cat5 in our walls, uh, you know, Ethernet's a great solution, and uh, 802.11n is looking to be a really good wireless solution. And, uh, and frankly, I'm really excited about Powerline uh, home networking as well, uh, with uh, uh, HomePlug AV being a really uh, exciting uh, technology uh, that I think will offer, you know, yet a third uh, way for people to get a robust, uh, very capable home network and start to uh, really enjoy uh, these, uh, you know, client server sort of usage models uh, in the home. Did you get the photo up? <laughs> <laughs> All right, anything goes. Any question, anytime. Okay, let me first have people raise their hands who haven't already asked a question. Okay, I just want to make sure everybody gets like a, fair, a reasonable, fair shot. Okay, how about the, uh, um, the gentleman on the side here? I have actually two questions. The first one is that what's going to happen with the reset logic when you have more and more cores inside the system than that? You have more and more capacity that way. In, in a sense, in a uh, couple of year time frame, one CPU play, for example, is going to have like a 20 times the capacity of current from a PCI TV. <laughs> so we, we cannot reset in such a place because we will want to have a million city capacity. So how, how are you going to handle the reset issue? Is it going to be through the virtualization, or is, are there some other hardware-based mechanisms for that? And the second question is then, uh, what's going to happen on the reliability of the components over the component lifetime when you go down on the process from the first to the 95, uh, 45 nanometers, and to the 32 nanometers, and on? Can you maintain the current type of lifetime by the 10 years? Because typically how we use the CPUs on the networking side, you turn it on and it's on for 10 years. And we don't turn it off in between. Those are pretty darn good questions. I don't even know who should be answering them. The, there, it depends on what slant you're, you're after. Uh, by the reset problem, I would interpret what you're asking about as initialization and configuration in this environment. Is that true? Uh, as, as you uh, have... Mainly when you have multiple threads of software running there, and if something goes wrong on the software like it usually does, hardware is a lot more reliable. I love to say that when I'm a hardware guy. But uh, <laughs> something, something goes wrong, and if, if there's nothing else you can do, you have to reset the system to start running again. Yes. So if one single thread goes wrong, it's the worst thing you can do is to reset the whole place, because oh. currently the, the, it's granularity is on the blade level, not on the core I understand. Level. Okay. Uh, a couple of comments on that. We're, our present firmware infrastructure isn't necessarily designed for large number of cores, even the, with the initialization and configuration. Um, and getting some concurrency into that is an area of research. For what you're talking about, I think your concern is as we aggregate so much software onto one processor, do we have an issue with availability, with part of a, a fault somewhere in the software taking down uh, a whole bunch of the system. And indeed, we expect that partitioning 
is going to be very valuable in that circumstance. And the question is, what exactly is the balance of hardware capability and uh, virtualization VMM capability that is best deployed there? You can use virtual machines to do uh, that kind of isolation uh, for certain types of faults. That works well. The VMM itself, however, is software and vulnerable to certain situations. So we're debating how much of the MP platform partitioning capability we need to bring into these uh, processors. We're going to have a large die budget. We're not necessarily going to spend it all on the processor. We'll have some functionality that is dedicated to certain processing functions for power efficiency reasons. We'll have some platform capabilities that uh, may make sense integrated onto the die. Now, if we do that, we have the opportunity of bringing to this platform some of the same ability to partition the fabric, partition the I.O. in order to create the kind of highly available environment that you're after. So again, our question is how much translates in a cost-effective way to this small platform on a chip that we're headed towards potentially? Uh, how much of it is really uh, overkill given that we now have the virtualization capability where we can, we don't necessarily have to share things with the virtualization environment, we can allocate cores, we can keep uh, independent isolation, but we're factoring that into our thinking about integration opportunities and the nature of the interconnect fabric to, to allow routing, uh, I'm sorry, separating domains in order to support partitioning. So I think that may be answering part of your question. Do you have a comment? Joel? Yeah, on, on the other part of your question, you talked about the reliability at the circuit level. Yes. And we're doing a lot of work there. There's really two aspects to that. Um, at the circuit level, you can have failures that are permanent, we call hard failures, which are a result of electromigration, where you know after a lot of usage, when you say use the machine for a long time, uh, the, the wires actually can break. And so we're working at the technology level to try and maintain those, those levels. There also is a, uh, an issue of transient errors. This is a result of a cosmic ray strikes which actually cause bit flips. And again, we're doing as much as we can at the circuit level in order to minimize that. Um, but fundamentally, what's happening is sort of from generation to generation, the combination of the reduction in the amount of charge on a transistor and the size of the transistor, those, those two factors work in opposite directions in terms of the ultimate soft reliability of the, of the transistor. So to a rough order of magnitude, the soft error reliability of the individual tri transistors is staying the same. Of course, as Ajay taught us about Moore's Law, the number of transistors is going up um, exponentially. And so if we did nothing, we would actually start having more problems with the um, actual reliability of the, of the entire chip. And so we're doing a lot of work, mostly in the areas for addressing both these at the architectural level in terms of detecting and being able to recover from these errors. So in the case of hard errors, you have to start looking at techniques where first you're detecting it, and the system then has to analyze and recognize, oh, this error that's happening is a result of a hard error. And then you have to have ways of replacing on the fly individual units so you can have enough redundancy in the design so that that failed unit is, is, is switched out. In terms of the transient errors, you have to be able to to detect them and often re-execute in order to correct the problems you so you can continue, or at least report the error and, and recognize it as a transient error. Uh, all of this is happening beneath the level of visibility of the uh, of the reset. So these recoveries are happening underneath that and only in the, in the much rarer case of, well, we've recognized an error like you do today, occasionally you see a fault and then you have to have to do a system reset. That should be the, the rarer case, the corrected case where it's um, transparent to the software uh, should be the common case. I'll, I'll one, more, uh, one more question. How about if you, for example, in the future you have 32 to 64 cores? And uh, one of them gets like the heart failure, you explained. 
and kind of plug it out of the system and uh, continue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We need it, when we start getting to that numbers, we're going to be looking at techniques where you actually have spare processors that get switched in, so you maintain computing capability, but um, certain processors will be switched out. Thank you, Anna. Please pay attention to this issue because I don't think we on the telecom side are alone because it looks like in the future your house or your home might get reset also. So. <laughs> <laughs> and that doesn't happen now. So. All right, someone hasn't uh, had a chance to ask one yet? You've been very patient here, and so uh, I'll catch that. Uh... Yeah, I was uh, mostly thinking about the crossover between disk storage and silicon storage. The, Intel have any um, insight into when that might actually happen, or if it ever will happen? Woohoo! A disk question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, actually, I think you get your. Uh, the question was about the uh, silicon storage replacing disk storage. You're already seeing that, uh, and there's actually uh, some a couple of examples where silicon storage has already effectively displaced disk storage in a few market segments. And I think over time you're going to see some of those market segments uh, uh, increase. The specific example that I could cite about uh, disk storage having been displaced is the, uh, uh, the iPod Mini. It doesn't exist anymore. It's been replaced by the iPod Nano, which does not have a disk drive in it. Uh, now, the, uh, there's other iPods, of course, that are video iPods and so on that still have a disk in it. But you, you, there's at least one example where you see that there was a, a very popular high-volume product that used to have a disk drive in it that today has been replaced by a solid state equivalent uh, of that. Uh, for mainstream compute applications, I think uh, that solid state is a very promising uh, technology and the uh, cost curves for NAND flash are so aggressive that uh, I think you're going to see uh, that for some, uh, for increasing market segments, that uh, all solid state is going to look increasingly attractive. Um, Samsung has obviously been making a lot of uh, a lot of hay with their uh, solid state drives. Right now, they're probably prohibitively expensive to be anything more than a, a niche kind of a thing. Um, but uh, the beauty with uh, the flash technology is that uh, if it's too expensive now, all you have to do is wait. Uh, and uh, uh, that takes care of itself. Uh, now that said, uh, the price per bit is never going to be, uh, be able to match what, uh, what a disk drive can do. Uh, but there are probably some applications where you, uh, uh, the, you might not require as great a capacity as uh, what you get with a disk drive. For example, uh, using the iPod analogy again, uh, once your iPod can hold all the songs you have and all the songs you will have, uh, then maybe there's not that much more value in having even more capacity, and that's the, probably what's enabled uh, the flash to displace it there. On a uh, laptop, I'm getting this, this thing in the back there. Uh, on a laptop, you can imagine that uh, once you have sufficient solid-state storage, that uh, you have everything on your laptop that you need to do your work for the day, uh, then maybe that's enough. Uh, so uh, especially if you complement that with a very good connectivity, so that if you did leave something on your server in the office, you could still reach it, but maybe it's not as, uh, as readily hand available as, uh, as on, uh, on your local store. But I, th I think it, that uh, it's, a, it's a pretty clear trend. You're going to see uh, more and more applications for solid state. Uh, that's probably displacing disk drives in some applications. My guess is that Sam over here for his, uh, his industrial stuff is probably already doing that too. So um, we're actually five minutes over now. Is that what this 